Hello, I'm Roger Hansen. Welcome to the Tri-State Warbird Museum. I'm the marketing coordinator here at the museum and my very special guest today, Mr. Thomas Griffin. Tom was the navigator on the number nine airplane called Whirling Dervish on the Doolittle mission over Japan in April of 1942. Mr. Griffin, it is indeed an honor to have you with us, sir. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> we appreciate it. There's a path in your life, started in Wisconsin in 1917, ended up in J over Japan in 1942. Walk us down that road. How did you get from Green Bay, Wisconsin to Japan? Well, when I was six years old, my mother died and my father uh, packed up the family and moved us back to Chicago from whence he had come a few years before to work in a bank there in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And uh, two of my older sisters, I had four sisters and a brother, and two of my older sisters were out in college, and so he just brought the, what was left back to Chicago with him. And what got you interested in aviation? What made me interested in aviation? Well, it seemed to be the coming thing when I was a young man in, in college uh, in ROTC. Aviation was the big coming thing of the future. And uh, we felt that if there was going to be a war, aviation would play a great part in it this time. Lots of people of your generation point to Charles Lindbergh in 1927 flying over the Atlantic as, as the one moment that really got them hooked on airplanes. Was that the case with you? That's probably true. That was a tremendous thing that he accomplished there, and of course it got the world's attention uh, to aviation as nothing else could have. You went to University of Alabama? Yep. I went, to, I went down, I wanted to get away from uh, to school for a year, and I went down there, I saved enough, I worked a year after high school and saved enough money to go down there and uh, I liked it so much, I arranged one way or another to stay there for four years and graduate from there. Love the place. And while there, you were in the ROTC program? ROTC. It was anti-aircraft, the other end of the gun. <laughs> and you then opted for a transfer to a flying assignment? Yes. I wanted to uh, get into uh, aviation, and I ended up down in Coral Gables, Florida, uh, flying with uh, Pan American Airlines down there. And they had a school down there with two old flying Commodore aircraft made up into uh, classrooms for flying over the, uh, the Car Caribbean. They had about six stools, uh, desks set up in these planes where people can do uh, aerial navigation and then we also went to the University of Miami there uh, learning meteorology. So we learned navigation meteorology there. Your first assignment upon completion of training? My first assignment uh, was in the first, w about the first week of February when I was finished with my training with Pan American. They sent me up to the Pacific Northwest to a uh, medium bomber group uh, stationed at McCord Field, Washington at that time. And I was there all during that year of 43 until uh, Pearl Harbor. What were you, uh, December 7th, the date which will live in infamy, do you have a recollection of that moment when you heard about the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor? Yes, it, it was a, a peculiar thing. They didn't have enough dormitory rooms for us in on the field there at Pendleton, <coughs> and many of us were living in homes in Pendleton the, itself, and that was my case. And I had some friends that lived in other rooms in this big house, and on December 7th, we were over in one of the rooms lip, listening to re musical recordings all afternoon, and about 3.30, somebody came in and said, isn't it awful what's happened? And we said, well, tell us what happened, Pearl Harbor. That's how we learned about it. We, did, we were the last ones in town to know that anything had happened. You're listening to Glenn Miller and... That's right, <laughs> yeah. What happened then? Uh, immediate call up, everybody no, go back they, to the base? They sent us up uh, to Portland, Oregon. They, they split our group up. Some of us were taking off of Tacoma, Washington, some uh, Portland, Oregon. 
and we flee up, flew out over the Oregon and Washington coast for the next six weeks looking for whatever might turn up. And of course, the Japanese, feeling they had done enough damage and could go elsewhere, had no intentions at that time of invading or, or attacking our west coast, but we didn't know that. So we flew search missions day and night out over the, and some other outfits flew off the California coast, same mission. The uh, Doolittle mission is, is arguably one of the most famous missions, bombing missions in mm -hmm. history. How did you go from looking out over the water for who knows what to joining with then Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle? Well, I think our people realized we were wasting all of this aircraft and gasoline and searching for something that wasn't going to be there. So we suddenly got orders about the uh, end of January to fly to South Carolina. And we got, when we got, the whole group was ordered to fly there. And when we got there, they said they were looking for volunteers for an unusual mission which had un unusual elements of danger in it. And uh, as far as I can remember, the whole group volunteered. Everybody stepped forward. After all, we were in the Air Force, we were at war, and we figured we were going to be faced with dangerous missions in the future. So they sent 20 crews of us down to Eglin Field, Florida to train for this unusual dangerous mission that they were talking about. And that was the short takeoff? That was that a, a major part of the training there was to get these B-25 Mitchell bombers up in the air in four to 500 feet. Now this was an aircraft that normally would take a minimum of 1,500 to 1,700 feet on a, on a regular runway. And uh, our boys had to learn to get these planes up in the air. Now these planes did not have an extra gas load or bomb load, they were light. And so this was going to be entirely different when we got on the carrier itself later because we were going to have a ton of bombs. We were going to be carrying over 360 extra gallons of gas in, in rubber tanks around on each plane. So uh, it, it was well to learn how to jerk these planes up in the air. But we had another big problem with all this extra weight when we had to take off from the carrier with 400 feet to go. Did you have any idea what the training was all about? I, I got an unusual assignment. About the first week in February, Colonel, then Colonel Doolittle sent me and another fellow up to Washington, D.C. And we worked with Air Force Intelligence there. Getting to, we were assigned to work with two men who were told to just get what we asked for and don't ask any questions. And they, they put a new lock on a, one of the office doors and, uh, for us to go in and out. And uh, we got all the information we could get about the Japanese islands and of China. And we got the target information where there were military and industrial plants that we could use for targets on this mission. And we got all of this together in a, over a period of about eight or 10 days, crated it up and took it back down to Eglin Field, Florida. So you were able to put together a short takeoff and... Oh, sure. We, uh, we, the two of us knew just what was going to happen, just like Doolittle knew. Yeah, we knew that. And you then went from Eglin Field? On the, uh, <clears throat> about the uh, third week in March, we flew out to Sacramento Air Force Base, which was a, a, a maintenance base. And they uh, put on new propellers on our planes uh, install these rubber tanks and everything we were going to need for this mission. You weren't flying. Sometimes that's even a little bit more hair-raising when you're not in control. What mm -hmm. was it like with those very abrupt takeoffs in a pretty good-sized airplane? Yeah, well, I was just on one of them. We didn't go up when they were training to get those planes in the air at Eglin Field. There was only the pilot and co-pilot there. The rest of the crews were off doing other training uh, work. So this was going to be the first time I was on, on this kind of a takeoff. I bet that was very exciting. Well, it was. A nice thing about our position, we were in plane number nine, and we saw eight planes successfully take off up ahead of us. And we were feeling pretty good by the time it was our turn. Forgive me, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves on this story here. So you, you got to the West Coast, 
and you had 20 airplanes, I think you said, in the group. Yeah. But only 16 went on the Hornet. When we landed at uh, the, uh, uh, over across from San Francisco that day, I forget the name of the place now, that the new carrier, our newest carrier, the Hornet, had just come in a day or two before and was sitting there in the slip. Alameda, the Alameda Naval Air Station, that's where we landed. Doolittle landed the first plane of the 20 planes of us, and the Navy said, we can only accommodate 16 of your planes on the deck of our carrier. You're going to have to eliminate four planes. And he did this by standing there, and as each plane taxied up, he would shout up to the pilot, how's everything with your plane? And the pilot, not knowing how important this was, if he just said something like, well, my left engine's a little rough, you're out. That's the only way he could do. If, it, if you answer that question with uh, everything is fine, then you taxied over this way and a crane picked your plane up and put it on the deck of the carrier. So that's how I eliminated four planes. However, those four crews went with us on the mission because of security again. They didn't want to leave 16 men who knew what was happening in the States. They thought it was better for them to go with us. And as it turned out, they were a good labor pool to dip into here and there during the 16 days we were at sea and, and uh, make some personnel changes on the plane. So it was good having them with us. At some point, you're not expecting it quite yet, and the loudspeaker goes off and says, Army pilots, man your airplanes. Now, wait a minute, this is several hours before this is supposed to happen. What went through your mind right then? Well, it happened, it was the morning of the uh, 18th day we were at sea. And I was, personally, I was down in the, in the boardroom eating and peeling an orange when the loudspeaker came up. And I ran up on deck, and just as I got up there, planes from the Enterprise, our other carrier that was with us, went over, and I looked over there, and one of our cruisers was shooting at a boat farther away, maybe two or three miles away. And I think uh, they, they emptied about nine, 900 shells at that ship, and the, <laughs> the dive bombers from the Enterprise went after it, and that was the most beat up ship <laughs> there ever was. They put it to the bottom, but it took an awful lot of wasted effort to do it, and bombs. But the fear was, of course, that these picket ships had tipped off they the had, Japanese. Well, our radio people could, had interpreted their messages back to Japan, uh, telling uh, the Japanese that uh, this task force with uh, two carriers and four battleships, uh, uh, cruisers, were coming. We had dropped off all eight of our destroyers two days before because they couldn't keep up with the fast speed because of fuel, for one thing. So it's launched now. Yeah. Uh, Halsey, Bull Halsey, was on the other carrier, and he was in command of the whole task force. And Halsey sent word over, take off, Army people, take off immediately. So that's what we commenced to do. Did you have any idea what you were getting into at that point? You're, you're, you're taking off I think off we early. had an idea what we were getting into, yes. We were going to run into a pretty hot spell. Instead of going in there late in the afternoon or early evening and bombing actually on the fire set up by Doolittle from the first plane, we were going to arrive over uh, Tokyo the middle of the day. And uh, we didn't know just what we were going to run into when we got there, but we found out. Well, the interesting thing for you as the navigator, and the weather wasn't particularly nice that day, and you're 600 miles? 650 miles out. How did you ever find the place? Well, it, it happened after about two hours in towards Japan. The overcast cleared up, the sun came out, and it was a beautiful day. And what I did, I took what we call sun lines. That was the only... Uh, a thing you could do for navi air, uh, celestial navigation. I took sun lines, which gave us a course line, and I verified it two or three times, and we used that course line, and we flew right into the northeastern section of Tokyo. What was your target? Our target was a factory down in the southwestern part of the city of Tokyo, the Kawasaki district down there, and it was a factory making tanks. And uh, we flew in 
when we were the number nine plane. By the time we got over Tokyo itself, we saw where eight of our planes had dropped their bombs ahead of us, fires and smoke and all that sort of thing. And by the time we got there, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, Air Force had gotten up and were after all of our boys. They didn't shoot any of them down. But we flew across Tokyo at rooftop level to make it more difficult for them to shoot us down. Actually, they had flak towers, and they had to depress their guns to shoot at us as we flew over the, at, huff to, at uh, rooftop level. And uh, we actually flew right over Hirohito's house at about 50 feet. But we had strict orders to leave the old boy alone. There would be nothing gained by going after the emperor. And if we bombed him or killed him, the Japanese would be every more, even more united against us than they, they would have otherwise been. So uh, we flew right over his house, just waved at him, and continued down to uh, where, where we were making our run for our, our target. <clears throat> Excuse me. You ended up bombing the gas and electric yeah. company, I think? Yeah, the gas and electric company was right next to this factory. And at, as we reached uh, the, our point to make our run on, the, uh, on this target of ours, I, I called down to our bombardier and I said, you see our target up ahead? And he said, yes. <laughs> and, and he and the top turret gunner, who could see what our bombs did, said, we really flattened that place. And it wasn't until after the war in the, German, in the Japanese archives they found what each one of our planes accomplished that day. And plane number nine didn't hit that factory. We hit the Japanese, uh, the, the Tokyo Gas and Electric Company and flattened it, put, put them out of electric for a while. Well, good for you. It, it was a good, <laughs> good choice, yeah. And what were you doing during this time. Ted Lawson's book, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. What was I personally doing? Yes. Looking out the window. Okay. <laughs> Pretty interesting view, yeah, I would look, expect. Looking at Tokyo, uh, watching how these, uh, these uh, Japanese zeros were doing, trying to get to us. And uh, they didn't shoot anybody down. We all got away from there. Your gunner took a few shots at uh, the zeros, didn't he? I'm, so, I'm sorry. Your, your gunner, he took a few shots at the incoming zeros. Oh, didn't sure. He? he claimed he shot several down. And of course, that uh, gunners <laughs> shot down about twice as many planes as the Axis forces made, you know, during that war. So you have to take it all with a grain of salt. Of course, some of it was a very honest mistake. Several gunners from other planes could be shooting at the same target, and they all take credit for shooting them down. That's natural. Bombs away. It's now time to get out of Dodge. Yeah. Off to China. Yeah. We all flew out to sea about 50 miles to confuse the Japanese defenses, to make them think we were going back out to a carrier. And then we turned right and we, we paralleled the Japanese islands. Now we're right down on the deck all the time. The radar couldn't pick us up. And, and uh, they, as it turned out, their air force couldn't find us either. And, and we were about four or five minutes apart, and we just flew all that day. Late in the afternoon, we got down to the farthest end of the Japanese islands, and we headed across the China Sea. Now, we were going to be going across the China Sea for about five hours before we got to China. But with the anticipated wind, which is a, a westerly wind, if we had that wind, over those five hours, we, none of us would have gotten to China. But there was a huge storm that we could see up ahead. And we got up and we took what you call a wind drift and discovered that instead of having the anticipated westerly wind, a headwind to hold us up, this storm gave us a, a strong wind out of the east, a tailwind. That got all of our planes at least to the China coast. Without that wind, we'd have all come up short and, and had the ditch in the uh, China Sea there. But the wind got all of our people there. In our plane and one other plane, we actually pulled up into that storm. It was nighttime now, and, and we couldn't even see our wingtips, but we just stayed on a westerly course. And we were 300 miles into China before we ran out of gas and bailed out. Share with us 
how exciting that would have been. It's night. Mm -hmm. You're over strange country yeah. in the middle of a thunderstorm, and now mm -hmm. it's time to step out of your airplane. Yeah. Well, you, it would have been a lot braver to stay in, but 100% you were dead if you stayed in. The way, only way to live is out that black hole there, and everybody bailed out. You were uh, uh, taken captive, for lack of a better word, by some Chinese people yeah. who really didn't know who you were they didn't or know what who you we were, were doing. That's there. right. We bailed out. Now, this was about midnight China time in this big storm. And uh, we got down on the ground. It rained all that night and all the next day. During the day, three of us from our crew got together. The other two, our pilot had broken his shoulder. We didn't know that when he bailed out, and he was having a hard time. And our fifth member of our crew was actually captured by Chinese bandits. These are men, they're AWOL from the Chinese army who are trying to make a better living going around living off the countryside. And they got our fifth man, and they were going to hold him. It looked that they could make some money from him, so they're going to hold him for ransom. And that was the situation with our crew. We wandered down through the rice paddies all that day, the three of us that got together that day, and we were soaking wet. Late in the afternoon, we went up to a farmhouse and indicated to the farmer we'd like to have our, quote, dry off. And he took us into a, a, a room he had in his complex there with a big round-bellied stove and a, it was a dirt floor, but he had a good strong fire in there. And we were standing around wring, wringing out all our wet clothes when we looked up and there was a rifle pointing at us from every window and door in the place, a Chinese group had been sent out from the headquarters near there to find out who these weird people were that reported wandering around through the countryside. And they caught us when we finally found us, when they found us in this farmhouse. And there was a, an officer at the door with a pistol and he had something, it turned out to be a Chinese scroll, uh, probably the warrant for our arrest or something. And I remember I went up to him and I said, Lushu Megwa Fuji, which was a Chinese phrase that we were told meant, I am an American. And it didn't mean a thing to this fellow at all. <laughs> he just stuck the pistol a little closer to my nose. So that we were their prisoners, and they kept us prisoners for over a day, overnight, and all that sort of thing, until we were finally identified. You were then reunited with uh, many of the other uh, members of the... Over a period of days and weeks, <clears throat> we got these people together and uh, worked westward into China, to Chongqing, the headquarters of the Chinese, free Chinese. <coughs> and uh, then from there, we left about four or five of our crews in China. We never, the Doolittle Raiders never flew together as a group. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we all, the rest of us flew over the hump into India and we left about four crews there. And the rest of us were sent home. Uh, and we, uh, as a matter of fact, what we did on this raid, we went completely around the world. We went from India across Africa over to South America and then up to Washington, D.C. So we'd gone completely around the world to accomplish this one mission. I wish that we had more time because your, your life is the, the stuff of, of movies and novels. Uh, we're going to have to cut this real quick, but you got back to the States and then you got reassigned. Got reassigned to a B-26 Marauder Group. We trained down in Louisiana <coughs> in, in uh, July, August, and September of 42. Then we got orders to fly the northern route to England, which was a big mistake and never done again with the twin engine group that late in the season. Over the days and weeks we flew over there, we lost six planes and six crews that just disappeared into the big storms and things. But we reached uh, England in, uh, in uh, uh, October. And uh, we were there in November when the invasion of North Africa came out. Now General Doolittle was in command of the 12th Air Force for the invasion of North uh, 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 Africa. 
So we flew down when they, when they got a feel for us in uh, Oran, and uh, we commenced flying for the boss again, uh, the whole bunch of us. And uh, we flew against Rommel's people. We, we moved up over the weeks and months to Tunisia, and uh, we bombed Rommel's people all that time. You had a very interesting birthday that year, didn't you? Yeah, I was captured. I was shot down and captured on July 4th uh, over Sicily. We were bombing targets in Sicily. And uh, we were the lead plane of 40 B-26s. And we didn't know it. July 4th was just one week before the planned invasion of Sicily. We knew they were going somewhere, but we, we didn't know just where they were going to invade. Turned out it was Sicily. But I was shot down and captured on Sicily on the 4th of July. And I ended up in Germany at Stalag Luft III, the famous Great Escape uh, Prison, and uh, stayed there for 22 months until the end of the European War. I hate to do this. It's been a fascinating half an hour. Tom Griffin, uh, Doolittle Raider, uh, cannot thank you enough for being with us, sharing your experiences with us. Uh, a, a true story. Thank you. Uh, from the Tri-State Warbird Museum, I'm Roger Hansen. Thank you for joining us and our special guest, Mr. Tom Griffin.